Uh, welcome, welcome all, welcome to our panelists once again and audience members. Thank you for joining us for this conversation focused on exploring the post-pandemic garden. Fourth space physically located on unceded indigenous lands in downtown Jajage, Montreal is a university-wide pl platform focused on working collab collaboratively, I'm losing my words, <laughs> apologies, with our community across disciplines to produce and facilitate engagement around research, teaching and various initiatives. We are delighted to work with Rebecca Titler, who invited us to collaborate with the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability to bring you this sustainability and the pandemic series. We are recording today's event and it, it will live on a link that I'll put in the chat in a minute. If you missed the first episode back in October, you'll find it there as well. So I'll pop, pop that in the chat in just a sec. We are also live streaming this event at CU Fourth Space on Facebook. Feel free to post any comments or questions there and we'll relay them to our moderator here. The chat function has been activated for you all for your reflections and your comments. However, if you could help us make Rebecca's life a little bit easier, and if you have questions that you'd like her to address to the panelists directly, uh, please use the Q&A function. This will signal to us that it's a question to be addressed publicly. Thanks so much. So without further delay, it's now my pleasure to pass things over to Amy Petit. Over to you, Amy. Thank you. So I'm Amy Potit. I'm, I'm one of the two co-directors of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center, and it's a pleasure to welcome you for the, um, this series in the pandemic. Um, um, our first speaker today is Katja Nevis, who is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, also a fellow at the Loyola um, College of Diversity and Sustainability. Um, her work is focused on social ecological dynamics and relations um, taking a critical political ecological perspective and focusing a lot in recent years on botanic gardens in particular and their relationship to biodiversity conservation. So today she's going to be speaking to us about um, suburban gardening in the aftermath of the COVID crisis. So um, Katja, it's your turn. Thank you, Amy. I uh, have a crew working outside my window, of course, as always happens with these uh, Zoom moments. Um, so I pre-recorded my lecture so that I can show it without so much interference from the noise, and that's what I will do right now. The materials I present in this lecture are part of a book that I'm writing on suburban gardening. This is a very synthesized presentation and so I am hoping that materials that don't quite make as much sense will be the cause for questions that will follow up in the discussion period. Soon after the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and governments in Europe, Oceania, and North America implemented large-scale shutdowns, concerns began to emerge about potential problems with food supply chains and with increased food insecurity due to job loss. Calls to bring back Victory Gardens quickly began to circulate on the internet and popping up on all sorts of social media venues. For example, here in Canada on March 31st, 2020, some 15 days after most of the nation went into lockdown, Niobe Connor reported on a Victory Garden started by Lizda Sidman. The article was published in the Vancouver Courier under the title, Worried About COVID-19, Plant a Victory Garden. A little over two weeks later, Debbie Goodwin published an opinion piece in the Global Mail titled, One Way to Fight COVID-19, and I interject now, plant a victory garden, of course, you've guessed it. And indeed, such gardens materialized over the summer of 2020. The Star reports that gardening organizations and community gardens everywhere 
came together to provide thousands of pounds of fresh produce to families and the most vulnerable population during the pandemic. The newspaper continues that this includes one Oshawa grassroots organization, which, through its five urban community gardens in Oshawa, provided hundreds of pounds of fresh produce to families in need, all while providing community-grown food. I mention Oshawa because it will be the example I will use in the context of this presentation. It's also the site where I'm conducting research to include in the book that I'm currently writing on this topic. But what exactly is a victory garden? This is a type of gardening that would have been familiar to the generation of my parents or my grandparents during the Second World War. Victory gardens were also popular much earlier, especially in North America during the First World War. There are some differences between victory gardens in North America and victory gardens in the UK. In North America, Americans were summoned to perform patriotic duty to grow their own victory gardens so as to release, and I quote, commercial crops and canned goods for war demands. In the UK, the campaigns were focused mostly as a war effort to counter the Nazi blockade that was preventing convoys from reaching the island and including convoys that brought food to the British people. These campaigns invited those who could not join the war effort directly by taking up arms and fighting on the continent against Nazis to take up the spade as their weapon to defeat the enemy. References were quite little, in fact. Slogans included, use the spade, not ships, as the one that you're looking at, but oftentimes even more direct references in terms of the spade being an epon, weapon that was akin to a gun that one might use in an army. Akin in terms of its importance, of course. Both in North America and in the UK, the Victory Garden campaigns were government-led initiatives. Here we have some examples of how this might have looked at the time. So people were given advice on how to grow things and what grows well with what in terms of co-crops. They were also given tables of when to plant different crops, how to keep them apart, and many, many other details on how to successfully grow a garden in your own front yard or backyard, depending on the case. And also in the case of the UK, for the most part, in allotments for those whose homes did not allow for gardening. There are very useful lessons to be learned from the Victory Gardens experiment in the UK and in North America during the First and Second World Wars. In the next slide, I'll go over a few of these, especially those that are more relevant to our contemporary context. These examples are not exhaustive, however, since I want to keep everything within the scope of the 15 minutes that are allocated to my presentation. There is much to be learned from the Victory Gardens that could still be applicable today, such as, for example, materials that work best for teaching non-experts how to grow their own food, trial and error, and the example of the Victory Gardens in the UK, where some of the gardens that the government proposed didn't work in all areas. They weren't climate specific, and also other kinds of local specificities that needed to be taken into account. Issues like collaborations across different kinds of knowledge were also important, such as, for example, local garden clubs and people just starting to learn how to produce their food. And then there is the issue of governance and the presence of a strong government, which were typical of the World War II era and which are no longer the same that one can see, especially in North America which therefore raises questions about the flexibility of current governance to take such a leading position.
And this is where I part ways with the calls to bring back the Victory Garden that we saw early this spring. I find that Sheila Cola's proposition that we should shift from the idea of a Victory Garden to a Resiliency Garden is the perfect way to put this contention. Sheila Cole is a conservation biologist working in the Environmental Studies program at York University in Toronto. And I do think that her terminology is the most adequate to express the ideas that I'm going to present next. Cola basically argues that if we're going to bring back the Victory Garden to address issues of food security in the present context coming from job loss and the disruption of supply chains that was caused by COVID, we need to also take into account at the present juncture matters such as biodiversity loss and climate change mitigation both of which tie to supply chains, heat island effects, and the absence of trees in suburbia. But there are other aspects that as a social scientist I bring in and would like to highlight. First, the capitalist industrial gardening matrix that characterizes gardening in suburbia and its dependency on petroleum-based chemicals as fertilizers and as weed killing agents and so on and also sociocultural dimensions of suburban gardening, which intersect with what I'm calling suburban political economy. I'll explain this in greater detail below. And finally, as a social scientist, I believe that we need to rethink the Victory Garden in terms of its relationship to community building, as well as their ability to deal with or help mitigate issues of mental health. Lest the idea of a victory garden post-COVID sound quaint and romantic, I would like you to look at this slide to see to what extent Canadians are actually worried about the potential impact of COVID-19 on hunger and food insecurity. These graphs here indicate that at least 50% of Canadians are either very worried or quite worried about access to food, whether because of supply chain disruption or because of cost of food itself. And in this graph, you will see that 59% of Canadians find that agriculture and agri-food are extremely important, with another 27% agreeing that it is a very important issue. And when it comes to biodiversity loss, it's important to remember that if we consider the example of Oshawa, and how much land was lost to developments between 1970 and 2020, you will see that basically there was a loss of 155 square kilometers of natural and semi-natural land within this time period. That's basically roughly the area uh, that Paris occupies. And if you look at the area of agricultural land that has been lost, we're looking at 240 square kilometers. It's important to keep in mind that Oshawa is just one of many suburban areas that have expanded during this period in Ontario. So it's a mere illustration and it's actually not the most dramatic change that occurred in a small city. It just happens to be the one where I'm collecting a lot of materials for my book. In addition to focusing on the issue of the ecological resiliency of urban gardens, as COLA proposes, the following areas of intervention are crucial. These different areas correspond to chapters in my book, at least some of them, and therefore come with rather complex arguments. I am oversimplifying them as I present them here, 
So please feel free to ask for clarification during the question period. So first of all, there's a political economy of suburban real estate and especially a post-welfare state. And in this context, homes basically operate as financial assets that people invest in in order to have a, an egg nest for retirement or for dealing with potential health emergencies that may come along. This contrasts to European traditions where a house is first and foremost a home and only secondarily seen as an asset. Within this political economic context, the aesthetics of one's house is absolutely crucial. People I have interviewed in suburbia often mention that they need to have their homes tip-top shape so that they can sell them at any point in time should an emergency arise. But even if they do not think they're going to sell their homes in the near future, this aesthetic becomes a cultural norm and there is pressure from fellow neighbors for one to conform to it. Moreover, Things such as trees and shrubs and other kinds of greenery close to the home are often seen as a threat. Many of the people I interview, when they look at a tree, they say the potential danger of leaves getting stuck in drains that in turn will create water damage to one's house. And they see shrubs as a danger of hosting all kinds of rodents that may then also damage one's property. These aesthetics and the political economy that they are intertwined with are enforced by bylaws. These bylaws are meant to address the political economy of suburban real estate once you look at them carefully, rather than promote biodiversity or conditions for food production. In fact, I have analyzed a lot of these bylaws very carefully and was surprised that they are actually, for the most part, very vague. But they tend to be very precise when it comes to the height of the lawn that you're allowed to have, what kinds of things you're allowed to produce in your front yard, and so on. And they are intimately related to the aesthetic of the cliché many of us have about suburbia. I just want to add two more points, uh, and that is that this particular aesthetic is also linked to very big businesses in relation to suburban gardening. And those are the big surface nurseries where plants are sold ready in pots to just be put into the soil. Um, and of course, it's linked to the petro industry of fertilizers and weed killers and so on. I never thought that this industry was as big as it actually is until I started looking into this. For example, in the UK, the nursery business is one of the largest um, sources in the country's national uh, PIB, so it's quite significant. There's also the business of selling soil. So if you look at new developments, you will notice that the first thing that happens is that what was formerly agricultural land or biodiverse land is stripped of its top soil. Homes are built and that topsoil is not then put back. It's actually sold to other developments that are further along where people need to buy soil to make up for the soil that has been stripped uh, from the places that they moved into. The point here about soil is that if we're going to think about a victory garden in a post-COVID context where people are producing food as well as addressing ecological issues, we need to address the issue of the soil's quality and how it could be ameliorated because it is a very significant problem in suburbia. And finally, the two other issues that need to be addressed is to teach people how to garden and um, how to garden differently depending on where they are and the soil that they are uh, left with, and also matters of decolonization. The latter is actually quite an important issue because part of what happens with highlighting victory gardens is that we are highlighting what is basically a middle-class white project. And in fact, this obscures a long tradition 
of activist gardening in urban and suburban centers by other ethnic and multicultural groups. So for example, there's a very rich tradition of black activist gardening all over the US and in fact Canada uh, with a very rich tradition that actually uh, incorporates not just issues of food security but even biodiversity. And these are totally overshadowed from the perspective of analogies to Victory Gardens. And of course, there's also the issue of indigenous peoples and the lands that we still occupy, as well as the uh, traditional knowledge practices that they hold and which could actually play very important roles in a post-COVID garden that actually mitigates biodiversity loss and climate change in addition to dealing with food security issues. And then closing, I would just like to point to the Green New Deal as a matter that ought to be debated within the context of the issues we've covered in this presentation. And questions that emerge, as I had raised earlier in relation to the Victory Gardens, about what the role of government might be and to what extent do we expect the government to be leading a Green New Deal process or to allow it to be a grassroots movement, or perhaps even a balance between the two matters. This is an important debate because if you consider the Victory Gardens, the strong hand of intervention from government is what actually led to the wide acceptance and implementation of Victory Gardens. So if we wish to move quickly into the wide acceptance and implementation of post-COVID gardens, questions of governance are inevitably going to have to be raised, especially if we consider the issue of bylaws that actually stand in the way of these propositions at present. And I will end here, thanking you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katya. Um, Thank you, Rebecca. I have a, we have now just a little bit of time for some points of clarification. And then the way that we usually run this is we have a couple of quick questions. If anybody has any um, fairly straightforward questions for Katya on her presentation, uh, and then we'll let Andrea speak, our second speaker, and then we'll have time for questions that can be addressed to, to both speakers. Um, but we do want to make sure that, uh, that both speakers get a chance to speak and also that they have time and that you have time to address questions to both of them. So if you want to, if you have any quick questions, you can put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I have one. Okay. Um, I have one very quick one, just a point of clarification, Katya, I want to make sure that I heard right that you said the development companies clear the topsoil off and then sell it to somebody else. So basically they steal the soil and then sell it back to the people. That's right. That, that's exactly what happens. And most of the, these properties actually are bought with a contract where you're supposed to get a certain layer of, of soil of a certain quality, but that usually does not happen. And the average person is not aware of that because then they get these laws that you just sort of unfold like a rug. So by the time they start to try to plant things that are a bit more complex, that's when they realize the issue and it's usually too late. Wow, okay. So then they go out and they buy the soil that has in the meantime been stripped from other uh, developments. Right, that sounds like a really great racket. Um, does anybody else have any quick questions before we move on? Okay, in that case, if you, if you think of any questions, keep them for after Andrea's talk. I'm going to let Amy introduce Andrea, our next speaker. Okay, we actually did have another question in the in the chat. It went to the, the chat rather than the um, Q and A. So I, since there is a question, I'm going to pose that one. It was, do you have research on bylaws that require developers in high density areas like Montreal to create space for gardening? Yes, that's Jill's question. I saw that. That's a really good question. Yes. The answer, the short one is yes. The long one is they were, there's workarounds where they are within the law, but not within the spirit of the law. So the, these are highly contentious issues. In some places it works, depending on the constructor and other places they, they work around it such that it looks like they're complying and in fact, not really in terms of what's intended. 
Okay, great. So um, now let me introduce um, Andrea Trombley. She's our spe second speaker. Um, Andrea is a graduate student and MA student in communications. Um, she's a member of the LSRC graduate student community. And she is also, I believe, the initiator, not just involved with, but the initiator of Mind, Heart, Mouth Collective um, Gardening Project on the Loyola um, campus. And she is going to be talking to us today about urban community gardens in time of pandemic adaptation to the crisis. So Andrea, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, right? <laughs> um, so um, in this short presentation, I discussed some of the main issues that were addressed in the Mine Heart Mouth Collective Garden, which I created as my MA project on the Loyola campus. Uh, some of these issues are food insecurity, social isolation, and access to land. So we're currently seeing a surge of interest and in funding towards growing food in cities, particularly during this pandemic summer. Um, but who gets to farm the city and who benefits from the funding? We have the capacity to produce enough food to feed the world while using regenerative methods, but the current food system is part of neoliberal free market principles and a culture that are detrimental to the attainment of such an objective. In her work, Alison Blake Palmer, founding director for the Center of Sustainable Food Systems at Wilfrid Laurier University, illustrates how the lack of attention to these dynamics causes grave impediments to every level in our world. She argues increasingly food is provided through an industrial food system that separates people from the source of their food and results in high rates of food insecurity, particularly for the most vulnerable in our society. <clears throat> According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the increase of population in urban areas point to the importance of establishing a resilient food systems system for city dwellers. Director General De Silva stated that local actions are critical to achieving the goal of eradicating hunger and malnutrition, guaranteeing more sustainable food systems, which also are more resilient to the effect of climate change and ensuring a healthy and nutritious diet for all. Um, FAO supports local governments in their food system assessments, in the development of urban food strategies and plans, and in the definition of their investment priorities to strengthen linkages with rural areas. Diversifying food sources and becoming at least partially self-sufficient through urban agriculture is one way to increase the resiliency of food systems as well as to ensure food security in urban areas. Urban agriculture can be implemented in many forms. In 2014, um, a research paper titled The Potential of Urban Agriculture in Montreal, a Qualitative Assessment, Dr. Daniel Haberman from the Department of Natural Resource Sciences at McGill University illustrated how the island could easily satisfy its vegetable demands if hydroponics were implemented on industrial rooftops though he admitted that these operations are generally costly. However, he further highlighted that using vacant spaces requires lower operating costs and also has the potential to supplement the city's demands. According to Haberman, most boroughs outside of the downtown core could be able, would be able to satisfy their vegetable demands efficiently based on their land use composition. Statements like those are very exciting. They seem to go in the right direction towards attaining the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which highlight the importance of agriculture and sustainable cities. To achieve these targets, governments are integrating urban agriculture into their established and growing cities. In the spring of 2019, news media reported the city of Montreal's desire to spur innovation and growth in urban farming, agriculture, and local greenhouses by pouring $750,000 into the field. According to CTV News, the money would cover a study on the economic potential of urban agriculture, a feasibility study on establishing independent sellers or markets, and a day for stakeholders to discuss innovative ideas for the sector. The city of Montreal's initiatives initiative claims that its aim is to promote urban agriculture in a way that corresponds to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. 
These efforts aiming towards sustainable cities are amazing, but they seem to focus on commercial endeavors. They do not seem to address health and economic disparities that stem from food access, particularly the point arguing that local actions are critical to achieving the goal of eradicating hunger and malnutrition, as well as sustainable, sustainable uh, SDG 10 that calls to reduce inequality within and amongst countries. In Canada, one in 10 families with at least one child under the age of six is food insecure. For over 40 years, residual welfare states such as Canada have avoided dealing with the issue of food insecurity in any direct or effective way by relying on food banks lar largely supported by active fundraising, food donations, and inadequate government subsidies. Another issue is that poor nutrition and food insecurity plague students' community everywhere in Canada. And an increasing number of students are using food banks or frequently opt to buy cheap or low quality fast food alternatives in order to feel full longer rather than consume foods that would be more nutritious but digested faster like fruits and vegetables. The Mind Heart Mouth Collective Garden model that I developed during my MA aims to promote connections, consciousness and action toward deeper connectedness with natural elements and food production. It also aims to provide fresh, free organic foods to seniors and students who are food insecure and are invited to work in the garden on a volunteer basis for as little as one hour per week. Volunteers who come to the garden work according to their physical abilities and they all leave with some food. Any extra food is donated to food banks in the summer and to the high free lunches in the fall. There is one main rule, take only what you can eat without waste. This is a space for everyone to enjoy playing in the dirt, learning to grow food and where at least some of the time in the year, they have access to land and food that, that they are growing themselves. Furthermore, working in the garden can be self-actualizing. Anyone, regardless of socioeconomic status can produce food. It eliminates the shame of having to ask for food. A senior participant even shared how for him, at that point in his life, working in the garden a couple of hours once a week is all he could handle physically. He had worked in gardens most of his life and he felt immense pride in thinking of himself as a gardener once again. He also expressed relief about being able to do this without the burden of and responsibility that maintaining an, an individual garden involves. Another point is that by cultivating multiple beds as a group, we benefit from a wide variety of produce, something that would be more difficult in a community garden where individuals rent single beds uh, for the season. In 2019, everyone worked hard and with pride all summer, knowing that they were also contributing to the community they live in by providing food for the food banks. This model is inspired by the Alemani Garden in the city of San Francisco. And um, although time is of the essence here, I wanted, I really wanted to share um, this inspirational uh, video. <laughs> Hey, my name is Tolu and I'm from NerdWallet and we're just watering some of the plants we just planted today. We're from Old Navy. Uh, it's our first time here at Alamania Farms. We're really inspired by what they're doing here, what they're teaching the community. Um, just the fact that it's all food that they grow purely for donation. It's just a really amazing experience and the for me, the biggest takeaway was just the educational aspect, like learning about how to farm and how to do it naturally. Hi, I'm Tree from the Free Farm Stand, and I'm also a volunteer at Alamany Farm. And on Fridays, we harvest produce for Sunday, where we give it out for free in the park to low-income neighbors. Taste it. Uh, hi, I'm John. Um, I'm one of the 
regular volunteers at the farm. At the end of each workday, um, a portion of that food gets given away to the volunteers who have helped that day. So we'll do a communal harvest um, and uh, divide it up um, according to what people want and need and, and can use. So inspired by this model, uh, I had hoped to expand the Mind Heart Mouth Garden last summer, but the pandemic happened. And the fast spread of the coronavirus at the beginning of 2020 and the devastating effects on our communities, particularly on seniors, has shown how quickly we can be forced to alter our way of life. The general panic that prompted shortages in grocery products when our governments announced a state of emergency in early March also offered a glimpse of the speed at which food insecurity can become a global scourge, even more so for the most vulnerable in our population. As such, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted social inequalities and injustices and has allowed us to see how quickly essential community services can be shut down, leaving vulnerable populations without the support that they need. This year, I was not allowed to have volunteers in the garden, even after the Quebec government authorized the opening of community gardens across the province. And even if people in, from the neighborhood walked through the campus and garden all day long. But the mind heart mouth had to go on according to very different iterations than the one I had intended. So I took on working alone with a new mission to deliver all the food to food banks. So from June, I developed collaborations with the NDG Food Depot, Women on the Rise and the Concordia Food Coalition uh, Basket Program delivering hundreds of pounds of vegetables every week from June to October. While the garden did not expand, my efforts around food security in the community did. And like many community organizations, I pivoted, modified my model and found ways for the garden to continue to support vulnerable populations. Over the summer as well, in the context of a MyTax internship with ACT from Concordia and New Hope, I have been working with community groups to investigate how community organizations and initiative services were transformed to adapt to the situation and respond to the needs of the communities during the pandemic. I have seen firsthand how many seniors are living isolated with financial precarity and are struggling for, to access bare essentials like food. Um, working closely, closely with food banks reinforced my feeling of urgency around providing access to land and creating spaces where vulnerable members of our community can grow food in the city. When given access to land, people engage with learning and work to grow food with empowering pride, knowledge, and connection to food production. Amongst other uh, urban agriculture initiatives uh, focused on food justice in Montreal, I must mention the People's Potato, the NDG Depots, Collective Garden, Batiment Sets, Collective Garden Initiative, and the Dawson Food Justice Group. This is the kind of action that are critical to eradicating hunger and malnutrition, guaranteeing more sustainable food systems, which are also more resilient to the effects of climate change and ensure a healthy and nutritious diet for all. But I argue that these efforts should not only take the form of activism, they must be integrated within our government's plan, plans on the same level as commercial urban agriculture, which serves an entirely different part of our urban community. Because marginalized communities must be included in the co-creation of robust multifunctional food systems that rely upon participatory action, experiential learning to foster food security systems. And that will be even more important um, now, as long as COVID is there and after COVID. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andrea. It's really great to see all those great pictures of the garden and learn about all the wonderful work that you've done. Um, now we have time for, we have 
to hold 20 minutes for questions. So I will um, be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So if you have a question, please type it up. Um, while you're typing, I'll ask if anybody from the panel here has any questions that they'd like to ask, um, just because you don't have to type. So if you do, please un unmute your mic and we can hear from you. While everybody gears up, uh, I just want to say thank you, Andrea. That was absolutely lovely. It's really exciting work. My quick question is, uh, I don't really understand why volunteers were not allowed in the context that you're talking about when so many other things were, you know, working fully open. Yeah. Um, well, it was not my decision. I would have, I, I, could, I understood that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. No, it was the university uh, was closed, basically. And um, I, I did get permission, special permission from the dean to pursue research on campus. But, uh, you know, with the condition that I was not going to expose anybody or expose myself to risks of uh, COVID. So um, I agreed to this condition because I felt that um, it was particularly important to to grow food and support food banks this summer yeah, more than ever. Mm -hmm. You did a fabulous Thank job. Thank you. I do have a quick question in the Q&A, which is uh, the name of the researcher at McGill who focused on the potential of rooftops to grow food. Um, Haberman, uh, let me find his first name. Um, Maybe you can just put it in the chat when you have a chance. And I, I will. Daniel, send it out. Daniel Haberman. Daniel Haberman. Okay, I'll put that in the chat. I have another question from Jill Ditter as well. Uh, she says, thanks for the presentation and asks, is the garden model at Loyola transportable? I.e. could empty lots we used to construct, uh, could empty lots we used um, be used to construct similar planters? Yes. Similar oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm hoping to do that, actually. Uh, I'm engaging a PhD in January uh, with the Indy program, and that is part of my project, actually, to, um, to find land uh, and work with various um, either food banks or community organizations that are willing to partner uh, to launch gardens like that. So I'm open to uh, suggestions. <laughs> I have a question about that. To facilitate, I mean, it seems to me and I know, because I know you, I know that you have spent ungodly amounts of time in the garden working on this project. And, and, if, and for you, it's part of your, your, your research. Um, so, so it makes sense. But it, I, I see this model. I'm just wondering to what extent this model is dependent on a really, really dedicated volunteer <laughs> to make it work. And what it, would, what it would take to maybe not require that one or if there's a way to get around requiring somebody to really just volunteer their immense amounts of time. You mean as, as a leader? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funding, right? It's about funding. It would be to hire somebody to as a coordinator, which is why I want to partner with community organizations in the future to in order to have to work with coordinators to more to offer more of a guide um, to, to reproduce the model uh, elsewhere. So to coach and, and offer, uh, I also am hoping to have workshops uh, in the garden on, on gardening, planting, food, uh, all kinds of things that are garden related, of course. And also for, I think it's very important, especially for um, communities who are food insecure to learn to preserve food uh, that we're growing in the garden. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to remind everybody. Maybe I didn't. I didn't say this, but if you if you want to raise your hand with the little hand raisey symbol, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen, uh, so that you can ask your question live, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, I have another question in the Q and A's though, which is uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, how did the intergenerational volunteer recruitment work for your project in 2019? Uh, in 2019, um, I was very lucky. I was offered from uh, the Perform Center at Concordia. Uh, um, Christina Weiss uh, is working with uh, groups of seniors that are uh, either cancer patients or, or people recovering from various uh, injuries. Um, and she thought that um, 
uh, and, and these people are mainly seniors. And so she thought that this would be uh, a great uh, forum for uh, her patients to, to be able to um, spend time and, and you know, it offers also mental um, uh, care. Um, and for the students, it was basically, uh, well, I did get an intern from the uh, sustain, sustainability um, uh, program, uh, but also recruiting students with the ambassador uh, program, which um, I was not able to do obviously in 2020 and I had hoped to be able to do uh, in 2020. We also had a lot of students just passing by the garden and say, like, how can we get involved? And because we're right there on campus and it's a very busy uh, intersection where people walk through uh, to get on campus. So it, it's, it's very public, the space. So um, yeah, we had a lot of people just offering to asking how they could help. Hey, thank you. Um, I, uh, I want to remind everyone if you have if you have questions for Katya Nevis also, we do have time for more time for those as well now. Um, but I, I have a question from Jill Ditter and she's raised her hand. So uh, Jill, go ahead. You can ask your question live. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> I've never raised my hand on a, a Zoom before. So that's <laughs> my first experience. I just want to say again, I, I, I enjoyed uh, both of the presentations. Uh, I'm wondering, Andrea, in terms of dealing with the city, um, if you're aware they have these massive waiting lists for people who want to garden in community gardens but can't, and whether or not that would, I, I'm sure there's all kinds of privacy issues in terms of the names on the list, but um, there probably are a lot of people there who would be really excited to contribute to building like similar gardens to the one that you have at Loyola. Yeah, 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 I'm aware of those lists, um, but that's a great idea actually to to maybe, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to get access those lists, uh, but maybe just by putting a call out, you know, in terms of uh, finding people uh, who might be interested in, you know, maybe changing the format a little bit. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, thanks. I was just going to say, I, I'm aware there's like in the plateau, there's something like 2000 people on a waiting list for like super limited garden spaces and some kind of uh, attention to the project that you might want to do in the media could generate, you know, people contacting you, I'm sure. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for the input. Yeah. I appreciate that very much. That's incredible. I'm just thinking about the two systems, the suburban developed system where people are more worried about the aesthetics and the, the you know, the urban system where people are struggling to find land and wondering, you know, if there, if there might be some things that we can do to kind of reconcile those two social ecological systems, if you, if you will. Rebecca, if I'm allowed an example of how that has been done in Toronto. Um, the TBG, the Toronto Botanic Garden, actually had an initiative where they would um, work with people who had gardens, like suburban gardens. What's now suburbia in Toronto, like it keeps changing, right? What was suburban when I was growing up is the inner core. But anyway, um, so they basically had a system of bringing in volunteers to work at the person's garden. Um, so the person who owned the house might not be at all interested in producing food or anything like that, but they would give up the space uh, and the volunteers would come in and work there. So that, that's an interesting example of some of these interdependencies. Yeah, I love that idea. I love the, the idea that, you know, maybe somebody who was older and didn't have the energy to, to garden, but had the space could have some, some younger people come in and share the food. Andrea, do you have, do you have something to add? Yeah, just to add to that, um, there were actually a few people and that, you know, there, again, it's a very busy space, the garden and this summer, people passing by, uh, a few people actually asked me, would you come to my house and do that? And I could, you know, I could volunteer in my own garden, like I could do some work, but somebody else would be responsible for it. <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, similar um, idea. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question in the Q&A, which says, I don't know if this is relevant, but since soil was bought up, 
And uh, are there any resources that citizens can go to for their soil in Montreal instead of buying from big industrial sellers, especially for those who can only do balcony gardening, gardening who live in apartment buildings? And if there's any input comments on balcony gardening in comparison to suburban gardening, I'd be interested to, to learn more. I guess that's two, two different questions. Yeah, <laughs> I could answer the soil one. Um, urban seedling and uh, les, les serres jasmin, I think it's called. Uh, but urban seedling is where I get soil. Uh, they have an amazing quality of soil where they, uh, it's a third compost, a third coconut shredding, shreddings, I think they call it, and a third soil. So it gets, it's a soil that's very light and, and very uh, appropriate for gardening and uh, even uh, balcony gardening. And is that, does that cost? Is it a local company? <laughs> I'm assuming oh, that it costs, but. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it, 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 they sell it. Yeah, there's a fee for it because uh, they, they build this all. I mean, I'm sure they buy the original soil, uh, but they build the compost and they build the, they include the uh, coconut. Uh, they do sell it. Um, I did not find that it was overpriced, though. I found that it was a, like a very decently priced. Okay. Some municipalities do this for free. So the thing is, you have to be there on the day that it's available. So Oshawa has a system like that. But you have to be there at 4 a.m. <laughs> ready to go. Yeah. All right. I, I've noticed that on the on the corner of my street, one of my neighbors has been doing renovations and, and has dug out, you know, a foundation for an extension or something and has piled the dirt up and put a big sign saying free soil and people come with wheelbarrows and buckets and it goes. <laughs> right? So maybe just more of that education about soil as a resource. <laughs> as well. Um, the second part of this question was if you have any input or comments, and maybe this is more for Katya, uh, although Andrea also, of course, if you have anything to add on a balcony gardening in comparison to suburban gardening. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of examples of that, uh, especially uh, initiatives led by botanic gardens in, in a core in, in cities where they often reach out to communities that live exactly in the kind of places where they don't have access to a community garden or, or their own backyard or anything like that. And so um, the emphasis they place on this is not just food production per se, because there's only so much you can do. Actually, you can do a lot in a balcony more than what people realize, especially if you have potatoes on a container or something like that. But they really emphasize also um, ecological services. So, you know, uh, providing uh, foods for uh, pollinators and uh, habitat corridor contributions and things like that. So a lot of uh, inner city botanic gardens will have some kind of initiative. And the one in Montreal actually sells a container that you can buy and take to your place uh, specifically uh, to serve these different purposes, depending on what your inclination might be. All right. Amy, do you want to go ahead? See your lovely hand so raised. I was, I was wanting to get the two presentations sort of in conversation with each other. And the first, um, speaking about the Victory Gardens, um, we also had that discussion not only in the suburbs, but also in urban settings. And so we had people, for instance, that was one of the arguments for opening up the community gardens is that people needed to be able to garden for themselves to address food, food security issues. And that the, that need was greater than ever because of the pandemic. Um, and I, I'm thinking there's, you know, there's a difference between suburban gardening in your own yard and having a community garden where, but still individual plots, as was pointed out by Andrea. And then you have what Andrea's um, doing in the example um, in Alamany, where it's, it's a garden that is run by the community, but didn't seem to be individual plots. Um, so one thing is to, to think about these three different things and you know, how they relate to each other. Um, the other is to think about, uh, so for instance, it, it, should we be as critical about urban gardening in the typical community gardening away as we are of the suburban one from the perspective of Katya? That's one question. And um, then the, the question more for, um, well, I guess it's for both of you, but it's, it's thinking about the criti criticisms related to um, the reliance on fertil chemical fertilizers and things like this and 
the um, problematic nature of not having more systemic kind of support. I mean, personally, I, I think it's kind of cool to have the decentralized uh, mobilization of, of gardening. And um, at the same time, recognizing that that leaves a lot up to the initiative of the individuals. And again, in urban settings, these puzzles related to how do you even access the land to do this? And if you actually want to do it collectively, as opposed to having a collective area where individuals have plots, uh, maybe we need to have more government involvement in what might that look like. Thank you. Andrea, I don't want to <laughs> barge in. Go ahead. I'll just so throw a couple of uh, ideas in response. There's very rich um, comments and questions, <laughs> Amy. So it's, yeah, we're both kind of going, we could do a whole session on that question. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that, um, first of all, I find it very interesting when we start looking at the demographics, right? So you have an urban population that's got a very different kind of educational background where it's probably hip and all that to do gardening. And then you have a more conservative, and I don't want to stereotype or generalize, overgeneralize, but all you, you know, when it's election time and I get in a car, you, you could see the, you know, adverts for vote conservative uh, versus the other alternatives and, and even in Oshawa, which is very, very small, you have these different demographics and the, the closer you get to the core, the more likely you're going to find things like what Andrea is talking about. Um, but on the other hand, even just considering suburbia, I just wanted to say two quick things and then let Andrea have some, some time. Uh, first of all, because of how houses are positioned and, and so on, it's, it would be far more interesting to cultivate a collaborative approach to gardening. So there are things I can produce in my, say, front yard that uh, my neighbor can't because of the, how, how houses are in relation to the sun. So if we got together and collaborated, that would be much better and it would be much closer to what Andrea is talking about. And the other thing is, don't get me started on soil. <laughs> it's not my expertise, but I can really go on for a long time about soils and especially in the form of a rant. But what things that are sand with chemicals in them, I would say are not, that's not soil from the point of view of, of how I learned to think about soil from horticulturalists uh, who are into it, where soil is actually a living organism and so you want organic matter and so on. So a lot of what I see in suburbia is they're, tr they're dealing with soil but they're actually killing the soil and so it's it's an addiction right the more you do it the more you need of the chemicals and that kind of thing um so if, if you don't have some kind of government intervention in my mind then how are people going to know even that they're actually killing soil and that there's different kinds of approaches and how are people going to start thinking about different kinds of aesthetics that are not pushed by bylaws that actually are against that and so on so anyway, it, I could go on forever on this, but Andrea, please. Uh, yeah, feel free to go. <laughs> um, there's so uh, so many points there. I'm not sure where to begin, but um, reliance on chemical fertilizers, I think it's very possible to move away from that. Um, like for two years, for instance, uh, although this summer I had to, there was with, uh warming there we're dealing with more pests than people used to uh i'll just put that out there so it was so tempting so many times as i you know i have an invasion of ants and i have an invasion of flies and then um and then the japanese beetles and, and it was so tempting to reach for the chemical um stuff just to get rid of those and when you're struggling with, oh, why is this not growing? Maybe like, and then you see that chemical fertilizer for the garden seem to have all the nutrients and proper balance, but they don't, they don't actually, they just, it shows it, it gives you the percentage this, but, but if you speak to proper biologists and, and, and people uh, like urban seedling, they will tell you, no, you know, you don't need that. You could put, I don't know, for instance, just a good compost in your soil and you will get all the nutrients you need. Um, you could add just natural stuff. So yes, in terms of chemical stuff, I have been able, and I believe that you can, there's also lots of YouTube videos that I've watched all summer <laughs> that talk, gives you natural ways to deal with stuff. 
uh, also soil is my little pet peeves we could we should actually get together one day just to rent um, government intervention I think this is crucial in in terms of um, in terms of uh, of helping access to land um, I am hoping this that you know to be able to reach out to reach out to the city of Montreal and I mean I look at the hospital, the new hospital that that was built and that has all this grass everywhere. Everywhere I see grass, I think, okay, I need, who's the person I need to speak to, to transform this? And there is a way. One of my goals with the, the 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 garden on the Loyola campus was to demonstrate that this is attractive. This is actually so much more attractive than grass, and and people that pass by, people that go out of their way to pass through the garden just because it's so much more peaceful for them. It's so much more inspiring for them. So it's not true that we need the aesthetic of grass everywhere. We, we don't. People actually enjoy the vegetables growing. Sorry. I'm <laughs> Do you want to say something? Gotcha. Uh, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I, I was thinking one of the things that I really like about your project or love actually, and your presentation is there's no better way to teach than to show something, right? It, rather than preaching, you could preach forever and you're going to alienate people. So I'm thinking about all the students who walk past your garden and who might have thought that, you know, the dream of a white uh, picket fence and grass and whatever was the appealing thing to do and suddenly they they see an alternative and that's really inspiring and in addition to that I think that we actually need to do an intervention at a very broad um, uh, level you look at a street in suburbia my neighbor is an example and they're nice people it's not about who they are so 20 bags were there on the curve last week leaves uh, leaves. So usually what my husband and I do is we steal, <laughs> you know, some people go on the neighborhoods to take the furniture that people throw at. We're collecting leaves yes. and composting like crazy. And some of the neighbors know, so they bring it here now. They're very nice <laughs> that way. But it doesn't make any sense because the leaves, 20 bags are leaving now. And then the spring come, you know, I don't know how many bags of things to, you know, make up for the oh, organic that matter that was... It's completely insane. And then if, if we were an alien visiting suburbia, what you see is throwing chemicals on grass so that I can grow so that you can cut it and then throw it away. It doesn't make any sense at any level, even at the level of economics. So what you do is far more effective in terms of getting people inspired than somebody like me ranting like crazy in a, in a classroom, right? <laughs> so, I think both are needed. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we definitely need both. <laughs> um, we're, we're a little bit past 4.30, so I think we're going to have to wrap up. But thank you both so much um, for, uh, for your presentations, your willingness to share um, with, uh, with everybody today. Um, also, I'm so glad to have the two of you share because, <laughs> uh, because I think you guys have a, have a lot of overlap and it, it would be great to see what will come out of, out of both of your projects. Katja, I look forward to your book. Uh, and Andrea, I look forward to your PhD. <laughs> and Rebecca, thank you for putting us together. You work your magic and it's always... Uh, <laughs> it's always super fun. Um, speaking of our series, we do have, uh, we do have a, a um, this is a monthly series. So every, the second Friday of every month, we have a webinar. Um, our next webinar will be December 11th. And we will have uh, Simon Langlois Bertrand coming from political science and Shadnush Pache, who will come from the Department of Building and Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, so again, very uh, cross-disciplinary. And the topic will be energy-related greenhouse gas emissions post and during COVID. So a little bit of a, of a change of gears, but we do hope that you'll come back and join us. Um, I need to thank a uh, big thanks to the Force Space, to Amy and Doug and Kari for all your great work, uh, to the LSRC for, for supporting us and the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability as well. Um, and I, I hope you'll be back soon. And I'll pass it back to Anna. Thank you.
Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, everybody, on behalf of all of us behind the scenes here at Force Face. Thank you to our panelists. Your research and insights are so rich and important. Uh, we really appreciate your time and generous interventions today. Amy, Rebecca, thank you for your participation and organization. And you, the audience, thank you for being here. I know it's late, it's dark. We all feel like we should be going to bed right now, but no, it's only 4.30. Um, just a quick reminder that a recording of today's event will be available on our website, and I've put the link in the chat, uh, but you can always check us out at concordia.ca slash four. And we look forward to December 11th. See you then. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care.